Oh hey, I didn't see you there. You've just caught me in the middle of fishing. It's, uh, it's very boring. But, you know, also therapeutic. Sometimes, after a long day, all I want to do is just sit down, cast my line, and reel in the fish. And let me tell you all, I have had a day. You see, it all started this morning when I asked myself, why am I still nuzlocking this game? This is supposed to be like a retrospective type of playthrough thing. What's the point of the nuzlocke at this point? I thought about this question for a while, at least five hours, and I came to the conclusion that, yeah, the nuzlocke was a dumb idea. But you know what? I'm stubborn, so let's keep going. I threw Lily back into the box and focused on training Leapster and Pinky. I don't know how long this took, but it was probably at least a few decades. I sort of gave up halfway through though, so now I have a level 31 Trap Hinch and a level 26 Laleep. Ufiena is also here, the loyal HM Steed. I returned to Mauville soon after to pick up Blip back from the daycare center. He is a hardened soldier now, ready for war. On that note, Ninkata has arguably the coolest evolution in the entire franchise. As at level 20, Ninkata will not only evolve into Ninjask, but if you have a spare party slot, you will find the Empty Shell Shedinja. Ninjask has the ludicrous ability Speed Boost, raising its speed stat after every turn. Do you think it needed the boost? Shedinja is a bug ghost type with the ability Wonder Guard, nullifying any and all damage except from super effective attacks. And also weather. And also entry hazards. And also he has 1 HP. Okay, you're going to the box. Later on, I also returned to Fall Arbor and retaught Blip Sword Stance. This is gonna be fun. Alright, this is the team now. What went wrong? When we last left off, we just got access to HM Surf. This is arguably the most important HM in the game, due to how much of the region is just ocean. As such, if you don't have a Water-type Pokémon by this point, congrats! To continue the story, return to Mauville and head right to Route 118. Previously, without Surf, we only had access to a small part of this route. But now, we can cross the ocean, fight a level 16 Wingull, because sure, and finally see the other side of the Hoenn region. You'll also meet Steven again, and he talks about how much he loves Rock and Stone, brother. To the right is Route 123. 90% of this route is inaccessible, but we do have the Berry Master's house. This place is essentially a spot where you can plant a bunch of berries at once. It is useful, even if it is a bit far from Mauville. I took a break from the main path and returned to Mauville. Again. Mauville is the Peach's castle of Pokémon. I noticed Watson standing out in the open, and he has a side quest for us. No, seriously, a genuine side quest. It's completely optional. This is the first time in this entire playthrough where I feel like I'm playing an RPG. Watson gives you the key to New Mauville, an underground sector found on Route 110. Shoutouts to this sign, by the way. This game is so stupid. I love it. New Mauville is filled with a whole bunch of electric-type Pokémon. Do you guys think they're gonna do that thing where a Voltorb disguises itself as an item on the ground? Holy shit! New Mauville is a small dungeon. You got some switches to press, a few Voltorbs to fight, and at the end you turn off the generator. Your reward for doing this is a Thunderstone and TM24 Thunderbolt. Kind of underwhelming, but I do enjoy optional content. Okay, let's get back to the plot. Route 119 is up north and starts with these unique grass tiles. And in that grass we have some trainers here that I think are supposed to be mimicking your movements. Every battle you'll have here is in the rain, since it's raining on this route as well. We have this house, which is filled with... We gotta get out of here. You cross a bridge passing over this river, escalate upwards into rocky terrain, and to cap it all off, the end of this route features this building, the Weather Institute. This route has a lot going on. It's one of my favorite routes in the game, in the entire series if I'm honest. Though I don't think that's saying much, because who in the world has opinions on Pokemon routes? Who is out there ranking routes on a tier list? Seriously, who? Send me the link. That sounds interesting. The Weather Institute is being occupied by Team Aqua. Why? Because clearly Archie just assumed the place controlled the weather. I mean, look at him. Do you think this man went to college? Fight through the grunts and the Aqua admin Shelly. She brought a fish and her dog to work. A grunt will appear after the fight, saying that Team Magma is heading to Mount Pyre. Shelly says, and Team Aqua leaves. The scientists are grateful for your help and reward you with a Pokemon, Cast Form. I would have preferred Cash. Cast Form is a Pokemon that changes form depending on the weather, which you can test right now on the current route. Beyond that fact, it's not good. I feel like this creature's existence is solely here to remind you of this game's weather theme. It's a filler Pokemon. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not really meant for battle. You may be tempted to continue onwards immediately after clearing the Weather Institute, and if you do, May ambushes you for a fight. She's only got three Pokemon, but it's still kinda rude. After that fight, the rest of the route should be a breeze, Damn it! Welcome to Fortree City, a town built on trees. This is where you can buy furniture for your secret bases. Good for everyone else, but I can't afford furniture at the moment. Look, I live in a treehouse, alright? Do you think I have money? 
The gym for this city is inaccessible due to invisible walls, so let's continue onwards to Route 120, using my wonderful gameplay footage that's for some reason moving at 5 frames a second. Steven's also on this route, and he hands you the Devon scope. I think that's what happened anyway, I can't tell what he's saying. This item's sole purpose is to let you see invisible Kecleons, such as the one right in front of you. Kecleon is a Pokémon that changes typing whenever you hit it. It's another gimmick Pokémon. I really like Kecleon, if only because of the Mystery Dungeon series. And if that series taught me anything, it's that Kecleon is a demon to be feared. It is a god amongst mortals, who would tear the world asunder if ever parted from his wares. I named him Morshu. Mm. Route 120 is another long route, but this time, instead of heading up, you're heading down. I really like how after a certain point, the rain will stop and you can see clouds in the water's reflections. It's a small detail, but I like it. Also, Pinky evolved, making him slightly less terrible. Route 121 immediately follows, and this is where we catch up to Team Aqua. They are indeed heading to Mount Pyre. And so are we! I have nothing else planned today. Mount Pyre is similar to the Pokémon Tower back in Kanto. It's a resting place for Pokémon, where trainers pay their respects. Is it wrong to be catching Pokémon here? I feel like the Shuppet was definitely someone's Growlithe in a past life. There's two parts to this place, the interior and the exterior. Should you explore the interior, you'll find that your Vibrava will almost die to a Wobbuffet. Twice. And you'll also get the TM Shadow Ball. The exterior of the mountain is where the plot is. I caught a Vulpix and named it Firefox. I am so clever. Team Aqua is at the peak, and they are so serious about this mission, they made my footage all choppy. How does this keep happening? Team Magma already left this place, stealing something called the Blue Orb. Archie leaves with the Red Orb. The old man here explains the significance of the orbs. Basically, long ago, two Pokémon, known as the Pokémon of the Land and Pokémon of the Sea, were fighting. Red Orb and Blue Orbs were used to calm them down and quell their fight. Maxi and Archie's plan is to use these orbs in order to reawaken and control these ancient Pokémon. A solid plan on paper, but did Archie and Maxi ever mention the fact that they're colorblind? The old lady will give you a magma emblem. That's about it for this place. That was a fun detour. Returning to Route 121, we got this game's Safari Zone. It works like how it did in Kanto. You can catch Pokémon, but not fight them. There are some new mechanics tied to Pokéblocks, but I can't be bothered to learn about them. I threw a ball at a Girafferig and it ran. I don't blame him. Since I didn't catch anything, I instead evolved Firefox with the Firestone I found off-screen. Boom! Instant Ninetales. Lily Cove City is home to our first and only contest hall. There's also an art museum. I think this is tied to another side quest. I'm not sure how you do this, nor do I know what you get out of it. But hey, it's here! We also have this region's only department store, with Mei waiting outside. Talking to her will initiate the next rival battle. She uses only four Pokémon, and her starter hasn't even evolved yet. I know we're not close to the end of the game yet, but I do feel like her team's a bit underlevel at this point. I'll cut her some slack, since there are still a few gems left to go. Oh, she went back to Little Root. She's not coming back, is she? Yeah, so that was the rival of Pokémon Emerald. Long story short, I don't like him. Gen 3 has one of the more forgettable rivals in the franchise, and it's simply just for the fact that they don't do anything. They barely have a personality, and if they were removed from the game, I probably wouldn't even notice. To be fair, your rival does have a different goal from you. Their main concern is with the Pokédex, not gym badge collecting, so it does make sense that you would outpace them. But at that point, I question the term rival. If you were to ask me, I think they should have cut the rival entirely, and then used their scenes to develop other characters like Steven, or Wally. Yeah, remember him? He also barely shows up. I don't think this game really handled its recurring characters that well. I could go on about this topic, but I just remembered that Leapster evolved. Also, I think Fortree had a gym. Reveal the hidden Kecleon in front of the gym and head inside. This gym's puzzle gimmick is rotating sprites, because the Game Boy Advance is the most powerful system ever created. Winona is the leader of the city, and she specializes in flying-type Pokémon. She carries a level 29 Swablu, Tropius, a level 30 Pelipper, a level 31 Skarmory, and a level 33 Altaria. Winona is a weird opponent. I've heard some people struggle against this fight, and to be fair, if you allow Altaria to set up with Dragon Dance, I can see it. Of course, I wouldn't know, because I one-shotted everything using Rollout. Winona simply cannot contend with the power of a very round Azumarill. Alright, six badges down, two more to go. Got to Environmental Terrace, trying to summon gods. I mentioned something about a hall. I'll be upfront about this, I'm not doing Pokemon contests. I was planning to, and I actually do have the footage to cover it, but I ultimately decided to cut it and save it for a different video. With that said, I can talk a little about them. I remember the anime was really pushing contests for Generation 3 and 4. They were always treated with a lot of importance, almost equal to the gym leader challenges. And that's funny when you realize how underutilized they are here. This game has one, count them, one contest hall. There were more in Ruby and Sapphire, but the other contest halls were replaced with battle tents. 
which only really served to advertise the new Battle Frontier. So you can't even do contests until over halfway through the main story. And in addition, they don't do anything? I want to save a full explanation of contests for the future, but I'll say it right now, contests don't give you anything in helping you beat the game. Contest stats don't correlate to battle stats. Just because your cradley has an IQ of 209, it's not going to come up with any new cool battle tactics. You get ribbons for participating, if you're into that sort of thing. I do like ribbons, I'll admit, but it's not like a major thing. I've never touched contests until this playthrough, and I'll admit, I had a bit of fun doing one, but not enough to justify sinking any more time into them. I can see why they were dropped in later entries, and I'm not exactly missing them. Well, that was a fun two hours. Now what? There's no gym in Lily Cove, and the route ahead is blocked. We can access a part of Team Aqua's hideout, which is just here, but that's it. Okay, let's retrace our steps a bit. On Mount Pyre, you receive something called the Magma Emblem. This gives us access to Team Magma's hideout. So all we need to do is find out where they're hiding. This is gonna take a while. Their home base can be found on the Jagged Pass. Hey, look at this, I actually recorded it this time. The entrance will reveal itself as soon as you approach, and you can enter. The Magma Hideout contains... Wild Encounters. Lovely. This place is a giant cave. Not exactly a maze, but a bit spacious. It's got random generators, a few grunts, and some lava pools strewn about. Team Magma doesn't know the first thing about interior decorating. After fumbling around, I managed to reach the end of it. Damn it. With the blue orb in hand, Maxi reawakens the legendary Pokemon of the land, Groudon. You may recognize Groudon for his impeccable role as Guy on the Box of Pokemon Ruby. It's a shame nobody ever told Maxi that Groudon is red, because as soon as he sees the blue orb, Groudon screams and flies away. Maxi sees us and assumes that we did something wrong and challenges us to a fight. He carries a level 37 Mightyena, a level 38 Crobat, a level 39 Camerupt, and... that's it. In Maxi's defense, he was probably going to add Groudon to his party, but still, what kind of team is this man? Team Magma retreats after the fight, and that is the end of this area. But we still got Team Aqua to deal with. I always forget where to go after this part. Long story short, fly back to Slateport, check out this crowd of people, Team Aqua steals a submarine, go beat them up. The Aqua hideout is much more put together than Magma's place was. We got actual tiles, guardrails, this man who's on patrol, and most importantly, teleporters. There aren't too many here, so you shouldn't get confused, but there is this mess of a puzzle. If you manage to get to the end, you'll be rewarded with a Master Ball. Not bad, but there's also a level 30 Electrode. And yeah, of course I caught it, why wouldn't I? Behold, mimic the Electrode. He could have died there. I gotta hand it to Archie. He knows how to put together a secret base. If only he could hide the entrance. Team Aqua's admin, Matt, fights you here, but Archie manages to get away. All in all, we managed to accomplish almost nothing. I am so glad I did this. Both of the evil teams are out of the picture for the time being. Now we can return to our gym challenge. All we have to do is cross the ocean. Okay, let's talk about it. Pokemon Emerald is one of the more polarizing entries in the franchise. I can say that about every Pokemon game, actually. Forget I ever said that. I think, Sorry, overall, I people do credit. like Gen 3. Come. It wasn't a revolutionary game in the series, but it refined the core gameplay experience and introduced many features still used today. There are definitely things you can critique about this generation, but most issues, I feel, are minor and can be ignored for the most part. But there is one major aspect that cannot be ignored. One aspect that, for many, drags the entire game down and ruins the experience. The water routes. In an effort to play up the land and sea theme of this game, Game Freak wanted to have an equal number of land and sea routes. A solid idea on paper, but the execution was... not good. Too much water is a meme within the Pokemon community, because it sounds really stupid when said aloud. But the thing is... I get it. From this point on, right up till the end of the game, you're going to be traversing nearly exclusively on sea routes. What's the issue with that? Well, for one... Yeah, that's not great, but a repel can nullify this problem pretty easily. The problems don't end there, however. If you haven't noticed, we are currently on water. And so are the trainers. And the wild Pokemon. Guess what you're gonna be fighting for the next four hours? This final segment of the game is infested with water-type Pokemon. Trainer battles? Water. Looking for a new team member? Hope you like Tentacool. Remember that Ninetales I caught earlier? Yeah, he's not gonna be doing a damn thing here. This is the Electrode show now. One thing I have praised this game for doing is having unique land routes. The Ash-Covered Route 113, the Marathon Run of 119, the Desert Ruins. There's a lot of variety here compared to previous games. But once you get to the sea routes, yeah, that gets thrown out the window. Oh man, I love this rock formation. Like, what do you want me to say? All of these routes look and feel the damn same. 
They just blend into one another, and the most unique things here are these currents and underwater sections. And the worst part is, I don't think it needed to be like this. If you got HM Surf early on, and if the water routes were more spread out throughout the game, instead of being grouped together right here at the end, I don't think people would be complaining nearly as much. But as it is, it hampers the pacing, and it's easily the worst aspect of this game. And this is why Team Magma was right. Moss Deep City can be found isolated on an island. The notable landmark for this place is the Space Center. You can find Scott right outside, who thinks something's about to go down there. He doesn't care all that much though, and he leaves to go... I don't know, talk about the Wii U or something? He loves doing that. This next gym is one of my favorites. The puzzle here is tiles. Step on a tile, idiots get rotated. The main gimmick of this gym is double battles. Every battle here, including the gym leader fight, can be a double battle. Like I said before, this game loves its double battles. Literally can't get enough of this stuff. The actual fight against the leaders, Tate and Liza, isn't too bad. They have Azatu and Claydol, and then Solrock and Lunatone. Does anyone have any opinion on these two Pokémon? Do you have any strong feelings with these ones? Adoration? Scorn? Lust? I forget these Pokémon exist every day, and I sleep soundly for it. Also, Pinky evolved again. Good for him. Our gym challenge is finally nearing its end, and with how close we are to the finish line, I think I deserve a small break. I think I'll spend the rest of the day at the Space Center and why do I even bother? Team Magma is hijacking the Space Center. Apparently, Maxi's plan now is to take the rocket fuel from this place and throw it into Mount Chimney to make it erupt. I would like to remind you that Groudon is still awake and in god knows where. You think Team Magma would be a little more concerned that the god they summoned is running around somewhere, but they've already moved on to plan B. The fight against Maxi is a double battle where you team up with Steven. You only control your Pokémon while the AI controls the other. I love the idea of teaming up with another person in a double battle like this, though this is the only instance of it happening in this game. As a result of losing this fight, combined with the other two failed attempts to erupt the volcano, Maxi begins having an existential crisis on whether Team Magma's plan is misguided. I mean, to be frank, the whole Groudon thing was your own fault there. I had nothing to do with that. Team Magma retreats for now, and Steven asks us to meet at his place. We enter his house, and he gives us a new HM, Dive. Now you too can experience the horrors of the ocean depths. Thanks, Rock Dude. I'll just slap that onto Peekaboo, and her moveset is looking very sad right now. On your surfing travels, you'll occasionally come across these dark patches. HM Dive allows you to enter these places, taking you underwater. The underwater sections have the same problem as the regular water routes, being too similar to one another and having only one type of Pokémon. One positive is that you can only encounter wild Pokémon in these seagrass tiles, and there are no trainers under here. But one negative is that you move slower underwater, because clearly that was the issue I was having. You're pretty much on your own for where to go next. The game is basically saying, yeah, here's Dive, find the next town yourself, idiot. Getting to the next city isn't too hard. You'll find this entrance underwater, and then you can resurface. This is Sutopolis City, a place built right in the middle of a crater. How do people leave this place? Or enter, for that matter. Is this the only entrance? Do other people have to, like, fly in or something? Also, the gym here is closed? What kind of gym isn't even open 24-7? You know what, this place sucks actually, I'm gonna go beat up Team Aqua instead. Return underwater and waste an hour looking around until you find the Iron Lung. Resurface here and you'll find yourself at the Seafloor Cabin. Cabin? It's a cavern. This place is an actual maze, as in many of the rooms here will either loop around or teleport you back. Coupled that with the currents you have to blindly follow, the strength puzzles, and the grunts you have to fight, this is the worst dungeon in the game. But, if you stick through it all, you will be rewarded with the TM Earthquake, one of the best moves of all time. Slap that onto a Pokémon and decimate everything that stands in your way. Starting with this generation, it even hits multiple Pokémon in double battles. So yeah, it is worth trudging through this whole cave and- oh shit, yeah, I forgot about that guy. Archie appears and is about to reawaken the legendary Pokémon of the sea, Kyogre. But first, we have one last fight. Or first fight. This is our first fight with Archie. Why? Archie carries a level 41 Mightyena, Crobat, and a level 43 Sharpedo. Archie's team is literally just Maxi's team, but with a higher level and a shark instead of a camel. They're perfect for each other. Archie, once defeated, decides to wake up Kyogre anyway because why wouldn't he? The Red Orb reacts on its own, awakening Kyogre. In a similar fashion to Groudon, he screams and flies away. Maxi then shows up, and then they start yelling at each other. Again, just like a real married couple. Everyone then exits the cavern to find- oh shit, the world's ending. With Groudon and Kyogre now active, they are both fighting without a care for their surroundings, causing intense sunlight and downpour. And should they continue, the world may very well likely end. Maxi and Archie both decide to put aside their differences and do... something about this, and leave. Steven then flies in to state the obvious and flies out to Zootopolis. Wise as ever, Rock Dude. Okay, this is new. 
This is the first Pokemon game to heavily involve the legendary Pokemon into the narrative, and at the time, I'm sure this was special. Keywords there being, at the time. Something you may not notice right away is that the intense weather happening isn't just flavor text. If you enter a fight while this is happening, you'll either have rain or sunlight present in the battle. This effect only extends to a few routes, but it's still a fun detail. Groudon and Kyogre can be found in the middle of Sutopolis. Now, I'm not one to place bets or anything, but I am going to say that Kyogre is completely outmatched. Get his ass, Groudon. Archie and Maxi stand close by, but the Pokémon are not responding to the orbs. I am convinced they're colorblind. There is no reasonable explanation for this. Go talk to Steven. He'll lead you into the Cave of Origin to speak to a mysterious man. This is Wallace, the former gym leader of Sutopolis. This is the first time we meet him in this game, and I want you to keep this in mind for later, okay? Got it? Good. This is important. He tells us that there is a third ancient Pokémon out there, one that could subdue Groudon and Kyogre's battle. The Pokémon of the Sky, Rayquaza. Now, me being Mr. Pokémon and all, Wallace believes that I may in fact know where this Pokémon is. We can either say Rayquaza is in the Cave of Origin, which we're currently standing in, Mount Pyre, which we were just at, Sky Pillar, a place I have never heard of, or we could just be honest and say, yeah, Wallace, I... I don't know, man. The answer is Sky Pillar. I don't know what Sky Pillar is, I just nod my head and say, yep, mm-hmm. He proclaims that we must make post-haste, but he forgot to grab me before he left. Yeah, no, it's okay, I'll just catch up. Ooh, a Sableye. I did more swimming and found the entrance to Sky Pillar. Wallace actually acknowledges he straight up forgot you, but unfortunately he has to leave once again. He is trusting us to go confront Rayquaza alone. Have I mentioned that I am a child? Sky Pillar is home to the legendary Claydol. I named the Claydol Seymour. I wish I could take credit for that name. This place is really straightforward. Just make your way up to the top of the structure, and soon you will find the legendary dragon, Rayquaza. It's all been building up to this moment. At last, we finally meet. I have scoured this land for a Pokémon worthy to stand by my side. A Pokémon that will help me achieve my true ambition to expand the ozone layer. Archie and Maxi were fools. Team Magma and Aqua are nothing compared to gods like you and I. Together, we could form Team Sky. We could be unstoppable. So then, what say you, God? Oh. Bye, I guess. Okay, Rayquaza was a bust. I'll just fight Groudon and Kyogre myself. I'm a big boy. I have a bomb. What are they gonna do? I'm gonna fly back there right now. Let's show them what we can do. That was it? Well, that's the end of that. The legendary Pokémon, the conflict between Team Magma and Aqua, all of it was building up to that. Rayquaza flies down, says ah, and the other two just piss off to the postgame. What, were you expecting more? Calling the resolution to this storyline underwhelming would be understating it. A part of me sort of likes how Rayquaza was handled. It gives the dragon a sense of power, being able to stop a quarrel between two other beasts with just a shout. But again, it's such a bizarre ending. We've been building up to this moment since, I'd say, Petalburg Woods with the Aqua Grunt. I think the ending to the Team Magma Aqua plotlines deserved a little more bravado. Maybe have a fight against Rayquaza before it flies away? Maybe extend Sky Pillar to be a full dungeon? Maybe Maxi and Archie fight you in a double battle? I don't know anything. This is one of the weaker storylines in the series. Not saying a lot, I'm aware, but I think it could have been handled better. I mean, even Archie and Maxi agree with me here, so you know I'm right. Speaking of which, after this scene, Maxi and Archie leave to parts unknown. If you fly back to Mount Pyre, you can find the two returning the orbs, and I believe this is the last time you see these two in the game. This is how their stories are wrapped up, an act that shows these two aren't as evil as they appear, just misguided. It's a good scene. 
Anyway, back to badge hunting. Wallace will give you HM Waterfall, our third and final water-related HM. To use Waterfall, we require the 8th badge, leading us to our next point, the final Pokémon Gym. The 8th Gym puzzle is an ice tile puzzle. You guys ever play Thin Ice? Uh, never mind. Thanks to the power of muscle memory, I cleared this puzzle on my first try. Our gym leader is this fancy fellow named Juan. Given the ice theming of this gym, Juan predictably uses ice-type Pokémon- that's not an ice-type. Juan actually uses water-type Pokémon. I hope you're not sick of water yet. His team is not a threat, grass-type, mildly a threat, a Pokémon I like but never use, and the only Pokémon I can classify as a problem. Kingdra is a part Dragon-type, removing its weakness to grass and electric. And this Kingdra has double team and rest. How did I win against this thing? Uh, to be blunt, I didn't. I stalled it out with potions, and eventually the Kingdra struggled itself to death. Truly an exquisite battle of the ages. And there we have it, all eight gym badges in hand. That's the end of the game. Thanks for watching. Check back next week for Pokemon Platinum, and also, I'm kidding, we still have like five hours of game left. Before heading to the end game, I want to do some last minute exploration. First up, if you go left from Sutopolis, you'll find the last major city, Pacifilog Town. This town is completely optional, which is a shame. It's one of the more interesting towns in the game, being on the water held up by logs. Where did you come from? That's a good question. The route following that will have these currents that carry you around. If you take a specific path here, you can find this underwater patch that leads to the actual best puzzle in the entire franchise. I'm not going to do it for this playthrough, but just know that it's genuinely the coolest puzzle. I want to give a special mention to Route 108, featuring the abandoned ship. This is a cool side area to explore, even if there's not much actually here. There's just some trainers to fight, and this unique puzzle. The actual rewards though are pretty underwhelming. Got Ice Beam at least, always a good move. After the water routes, I checked out a few other places I missed, such as the Shoal Cave. This cave's sole existence is to give you a held item, and it sucks. I did catch a Sphiel though. Wow. King. And after that, I got bored and shifted my attention towards crafting the perfect team, changing up movesets and deciding who will be in the final party. And after an hour of preparations, boom. This is my team. Peekaboo, the HM slave. Leapster, the one-trick pony. Flygon, the absolute mess of a moveset. Firefox, also kind of a one-trick pony. Mimic, another Pokémon with practically one move. Seymour. This team kinda sucks. The Pokémon League can be found right of Zootopolis. Scale the waterfall and you will reach Evergrande City. Where's the city? We do have one more cave to get through before reaching the Pokémon League. Victory Road. Are you ready? Because I'm not. Almost immediately when you enter Victory Road, you'll bump into Wally. Yeah, remember him? We saw him last in Mauville City, about, uh, 80 hours ago? Well, he's back, with all that off-screen character development, and he's ready to show off his all-new team. Wally has an Altaria, Delcaddy, Magneton, a Roselia, and his ace, Scardivore. Most of these Pokémon aren't too dangerous. The Altaria might cause some trouble if you let it set up with Dragon Dance, but otherwise, there's only one Pokémon you should be scared of. Gardevoir. Wally's Gardevoir has Double Team, Calm Mind, Psychic, and Future Sight. I tried burning Gardevoir first, and then switching to Leapstar to chip away at it. Unfortunately, Wally uses a full restore to remove the effect. I tried using Toxic, but the Gardevoir's synchronized ability also poisons Leapster. I switched to Seymour and used Sandstorm for more chip damage. Wally uses another full restore. I'm beginning to think this might be Karma for earlier. I make a bad move and keep Seymour in. He takes the Future Sight and collapses into mud. Okay, we can still win this. I send in Mimic next and- oh shit, he's almost dead. I throw in Peekaboo. She takes some damage and then- oh shit, another Future Sight. Alright, this is going great. Get in there, Leapster. I probably should have healed you. Cradley is pretty tanky. I can probably stall out the Gardevoir- that's a critical hit. Firefox, can you do anything? No, okay. Mimic, I shouldn't even ask. Pinky can probably handle this fight. That's another future sight, damn it. I lost. Well played, Wally. Hey, so do you remember the fact that I'm technically nuzlocking this game? Yeah, that's still happening, and honestly, the longer it goes on, the more I question why I did it in the first place. I make these videos to be like fun, retrospective playthroughs, and honestly, I don't think the nuzlock is really enhancing the experience at this point. I mean, it is fun to play the game this way, I do implore you try doing a Nuzlocke yourself, or any self-imposed challenge run, really. But in regards to this video, yeah, I don't really see a point anymore. I'm just gonna throw in the towel here and play the rest of the game as normal. On the topic of difficulty, I do think Pokémon Emerald is a step up from Gen 2 in terms of challenge. Not a major step up, but I did feel like I had to strategize a little more often in this title compared to previous games. I took advantage of stuff like the move reminder, held items, and TMs whenever possible. There aren't a lot of difficulty spikes, but the challenge does ramp up slowly. At least until I get to Route 124. Then I completely shut my brain off and click Thunderbolt. Nuzlocke aside, I'd still say this is one of the harder games so far. I cannot wait to talk about Gen 6. Alright, let's try this again. Round 2 with Wally goes by much better. 
Gardevoir died in two hits this time. I'm genuinely a little mad how easy it was. This is the last time you'll be fighting and seeing Wally in the main story. In total, Wally had... what, three appearances in the game? Four? Just like the main rival, the remakes do improve and expand on Wally's story. He still has a minor role in those games, but he gets a cool theme, and that's all you really need. Okay, Victory Road time. These are a staple in the franchise, at least in the early games. Would you believe me if I said this is the first Victory Road I like? And by that, I mean it's actually difficult. Like, wow. Unlike Gens 1 and 2, this feels like an appropriate final challenge. You have a gauntlet of trainers with powerful Pokémon, you utilize nearly every TM move just to traverse, and this is one of the longest caves in the game. Trainers aren't afraid to use fully evolved Pokémon anymore. This double battle near the end of the cave throws two slackings at you, in case it wasn't clear how much this game hates you. I didn't have any revives while going through this, so my team at the end was looking like this. I'm sure this is a good sign. I was too busy dying to remember what else happened on Victory Road, so let's move on. Welcome to Evergrande City, again. Seriously, where is the city? And welcome to the Pokémon League! We have the typical Poké Center shop section and the doors leading to the Elite Four. You can probably guess, but I did even more last-minute team adjustments. This involved fixing Pika Blue's moveset and replacing Firefox with Morshu, because Kecleon is a cooler Pokémon, I'm sorry. My final issue is levels. My team is a tad underleveled to take on the Elite Four. The Elite Four start off with Pokémon in the mid-40s and finish off in the mid-50s. It's a mild difficulty spike, but still better than Johto. This shouldn't take too long. I may have gone overboard. Here is my final team. Overall, I'm very happy with this lineup. It's a lot of random Pokémon I've never used before, and I feel it's very unique for it. Yeah, it could be better, but I'm attached to these guys. I wouldn't trade them for the world. Speaking of which, let's go take on the world. You should know how this goes by now. There are four trainers. Defeat them all to become the region's strongest trainer. Our first Elite Four match is against Sydney, the Dark-type specialist. He has a Mightyena, Shiftree, Cacturn, Crawdon, and Absol. His Shiftree might be the most annoying member, since he has Double Team, but otherwise Sydney is no trouble. He is just the warm-up. Our second match is Phoebe, the Ghost-type member. She has a Dusclops, Bayonet, Sableye, another Bayonet, and another Dusclops. Ghost Pokémon are hard to find, I guess. I find Phoebe's team more annoying than difficult. Curse is like poison on steroids, and practically requires you to switch out, and one Bayonet uses Grudge. Grudge makes you lose all of the PP for one move, and if you don't have any Aethers, that effectively gets rid of a move entirely. She's not the worst member, but I did lose Marshu here. And yes, I did forget to buy revives, thank you for asking. Our third member is Glacia, the Ice-type master. She has a Celio, a Celio, a Glalie, a Glalie, and a Walrein. What a great team. The biggest problem with Glacia is that Ice-types are strong against a lot of Pokémon, including half my team. Her Pokémon also know Hail, putting it up at every opportunity. I left this fight in Mimic's hands. Electrodes don't have hands, but that's okay, he still won. The final Elite Four member is Drake, the Dragon-type trainer. He carries a Shellgon, an Altaria, a Kingdra, a Flygon, and a Salamance. While the Salamance is his ace Pokémon, I honestly had more trouble with Kingdra. I don't know what it is with this Pokémon, I struggle with it every time. Mimic died to a Body Slam, Seymour couldn't get a hit in, Pika Blue survived three turns total, and I eventually slayed a beast with Pinky. I kept him out for the remainder of the fight. It was very tense. Dragon types are weak against other dragons, but my Flygon is cooler, stronger, and oh nope, he's dead too. I stalled out Salamance with Leapster and ended the fight. And just like that, the Elite Four has been conquered. After all of that, I can confidently say that Drake is clearly the MVP here. The rest of you really need to start pulling your weight. No, in all seriousness, this Elite Four was pretty good. I felt it was more annoying than difficult, but I do appreciate the challenge nonetheless. No, we're not done yet. Of course, we still have the champion to deal with. The most powerful trainer in all of the Hoenn region. The only person standing between me and finishing this video. Who could it be? Well, who else? He's been here since the beginning, popping up whenever the plot demands. Helping you, fighting alongside you. That's right, the final boss of Pokémon Emerald is none other than Steven Sto- You're not Steven. Yeah, this is one change I'm not a big fan of. In Ruby and Sapphire, the champion was Steven Stone. He specialized in Steel and Rock-type Pokémon. For whatever reason, they changed it to where Wallace is now the champion. Wallace was just the gym leader for Zootopolis in the original game. Why was this change made? I have no idea. But for me at least, Wallace is a significantly weaker champion than Steven. One of the reasons why for me is that Steven is still the one who helps you out in the main story. He is the person with you throughout the whole journey. Wallace is just a guy we met a few hours ago. He hasn't had a big presence up until now. So to reveal him as the strongest trainer in all of Hoenn, it doesn't do anything for me, because I barely know this dude. Anyone else would have been a better choice. Scott would have been a better choice. 
But that's not my reason why I dislike Wallace. It's a part of it, but that's just one fragment of the larger issue. This guy right here, the champion of all of Hoenn, specializes in water-type Pokémon. I am so glad I leveled up my Ninetales to 42. This is the most baffling final boss in a Pokémon game. Why does the champion of the region use the same type as the last gym leader? Why would you give him Pokémon that I have been fighting for the past five hours? If you've gotten to this point, you probably have a team built to take down water types. I certainly did. This fight is a victory lap. He isn't a pushover, to be clear. His team is very strong. But if you got to this point, you've basically won. That is assuming you're not me, who reached him with only a level 56 cradle left. I knocked out Waylord, at least. That's a win in my books. Alright, it's attempt number two, and I reached Wallace with my full team. It turns out revives are actually a good item. Who would have thought? Wallace has a Waylord, a Gyarados, a Wishcash, a Tentacruel, a Ludicolo, and a Milotic. His levels range from 55 to 58. Mimic and Leapster were the MVPs for this fight, as you can guess. You already know how this ends. Not even Milotic could contend with the power of an upside-down Pokeball. One good Thunderbolt to the face, and that's a wrap. Professor Birch and May appear after defeating Wallace. Birch will go ahead and grade your Pokedex. His final verdict? I am very bad at this. Wallace will bring you to the Hall of Fame. You already know what my team is. Did Seymour ever win a battle? I don't think he did. He's clearly the weak link here. And that was Pokemon Emerald. Most of it, anyway. We still have all of the post-game left to play through, which I may talk about another time. Emerald's post-game is definitely not as long or ambitious as Gen 2, but I will say, I think Pokemon Emerald has the quintessential post-game experience. There's plenty of new Pokemon to catch, including the legendary Pokemon. You can rematch against all of the gym leaders who have higher level teams, the battle frontier opens up, giving you more unique battling options, and this game even has a super boss with Steven. There's also stuff I've glossed over, like the trainer hill, the trick house, the secret bases. There are plenty of things here to keep you busy for hours. It's still not the best or most expansive post-game, but I do think it's the standard experience one should expect from Pokémon. There's plenty more I probably could talk about, such as the cut content, the mythical Pokémon, the limited time events, but I don't think any of that's necessary for this video. Do I even need to say my final thoughts? I think you get the picture by now. I love Pokémon Emerald. I do have gripes with this game, especially the second half, but that doesn't change my opinion. Is it the best Pokémon game? Far from it. I don't blame anyone for not liking this game. It's no masterpiece, and it's not even my favorite game in the franchise, but it's the one I have the most nostalgia for, and therefore it is perfect. But now you may be asking, what about the remakes? Yes, the Hoenn region got remakes in 2014 for the Nintendo 3DS, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. Oh god, that was almost 10 years ago. As the name implies, these are remakes of Pokémon Ruby and Sapphire, not Emerald. What this means is that these games don't have the Battle Frontier, 0 out of 10. I'm joking, of course. I enjoy these remakes as well. It fixes a lot of the smaller issues I had with Gen 3, and adds in features from later generations. The physical special split, mega evolutions, new evolutions in general, and they finally got that day and night cycle working. These games even made Sableye and Mawile viable, you can't deny that. They may have overdid it. I play both the original and the remakes from time to time. And with all that being said, I do still prefer Emerald. Is it nostalgia bias? Oh, absolutely. But it's my opinion. You can't do anything about it. I prefer how Emerald looks. I'm not a fan of the 3D visuals of Oras. I'm also not a big fan of the post-game and the remakes. The Delta episode is no replacement for an actual Emerald remake. There's just a few missteps here and there that lead me to not liking these games as much as Emerald. Plus, they didn't fix the water issue, 0 out of 10. And that's everything for me. If you're still here, thanks for watching this whole thing. I really need to take a break from making these longer videos. But I had a lot to say about this game, and I don't regret it. It's also better than all of Platinum. Oops, did I say that out loud? Hi, hello, welcome to the end card. Thanks for watching this two-parter. Um, I'll be combining both videos into one video soon. I don't know when, when I get around to it, so enjoy that. Um, I'm not really on a script right now, I have no idea what to say. Uh, so I mentioned in my previous upload video that I was considering doing, like, two channels, having, like, this one and then having one separated for all of the Pokémon content. I decided not to do that because my upload schedule is completely terrible, and I think having two channels would make that worse. So, uh, we're just gonna keep everything combined for now. Is it smart? Probably not, but I'm gonna do it anyway. See you around for Pokemon Platinum. I don't think I'm gonna do a normal video on it. I think I'm just gonna do like a retrospective on Gen 4. I wanna talk about things like spin off games and like uh, the anime, the uh, competitive scene, the TCG. I don't know a lot about the TCG if I'm honest. Um. 
I'm going to bed, so uh, see you around.